Something that I think is so fascinating about you is you came at this as a game developer. So most of us probably know that Ethereum isn't scalable at this point and that if we want to be trading thousands of NFTs a day, it's not going to happen on Ethereum layer one. You built Gods Unchained how many years ago now? Uh, it came out in 2018, mid-2018. Like, damn. And you realized in doing that it wasn't going to work on a, on Ethereum layer one. And so instead of being like, hey, I'm going to go build this on another chain or another L2, you decided to build your own L2. Why did you go that route as opposed to just putting your game somewhere else? I think it was a confluence of factors. The first was we knew what we never would compromise on. And mm. that was A, security. I never wanted to be in a position where I could wake up and have lost users billions of dollars of assets. And the whole point was to build infrastructure that could support the largest games and the largest applications in the world. So we're talking about literally like hundreds of billions of dollars in value pretty quickly. And to have that on something which was not fundamentally secure was unacceptable to us. But then the second thing is you don't want to trade off liquidity or network effects or the ecosystem. And so pretty clear to us early on was that Ethereum would be the best place to build. The question was then just how. And I think the reason a lot of alternative companies went off and built their own chains is that was a very popular VC thesis back in the day, was that was how you would build the most uh, value accretive product or, or the product that could be most successful. And ETH competitors as an idea back then was actually you know, very, very popular um, because we hadn't seen the sort of huge benefits that network effects would bring uh, that we do today. And we basically looked at every solution under the sun. Um, so for a bit of context, when we launched one of our major sales for Gods Unchained, it was the same time that Fcoin launched. And if you remember... I don't even remember this. <laughs> I don't even know what this is. So they're, they're, they're not, you know, they're not super popular as an exchange anymore, but they incentivized early adoption by having a uh, GUI incentive attack, which was basically they, they ran up gas on the network. And so for the first time ever, GUI went from three, which is what it had been averaging for the past you know, year, to above 100. And they were called Fcoin. They were called Fcoin. Uh -huh. okay. um, and this was their idea of a PR uh, marketing stunt, which did generate a lot of buzz, and but not in the right way uh, for them, I think. And in the end, the packs that we were selling went from having a gas cost of, say, 50 cents to sell a $2.50 pack to you know, above 10, 20, 30 dollars. So clearly the unit economics were crazy. And we had to work out a solution back then. Uh, in, in that instance, we invented sort of a deferred minting, which is, you know, used today by, by many different um, sort of applications and, and marketplaces. But what we knew was that fundamentally this was an optimization, not a solution. And we looked at pretty much everything from plasma, um, if you recall the, the early efforts into Plasma, which... I'm later to this scene, if you can't tell. <laughs> uh, so so th there were some ideas around um, Plasma chains early on that never really um, worked out. We looked at state channels, um, which kind of proved for, for multiple reasons not uh, particularly viable. We had a, a sort of a full MVP built. Um, we looked into side chains, obviously, and rolled them out fairly quickly because they're basically just like a separate L1 with a bridge to whatever they claim to be a side chain for. Um, and then we also looked at optimistic rollups, which were actually around a little bit earlier than CK rollups. And while it's fantastic technology, they don't really work for NFTs. Um, and the reason is because of the withdrawal times, which take about a week. You can get around them with market making. If you have fundable tokens, if they're unique tokens, then you know I'm not going to wait a week to withdraw my one of a kind skin or sword or financial asset which is an NFT, but I also can't market make it or loan you the identical kind because it's a unique uh, asset. Um, and also the cost base of, of uh, OIUs is significantly higher than CKRs. Um, and so we actually serendipitously um, found out about Starkware quite early on and the works that they were doing in, in CK rollups. And we basically realized that this was going to work. Um, so we did make a bet uh, pretty early on on ZK technology. It was not clear that it would be viable um, for the long term. I'm very happy we made that bet now. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that no matter what chain wins, my belief it's going to be Ethereum, but I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not sort of militant about that. I'm, I'm open to the ideas of a multi-chain future, but I very, very strongly believe that it has to be a modular architecture. It will be ZK rollups on whatever is successful. Um, so that was sort of why we decided to, to pursue this approach. Um, and I think that the reasons that we chose it now have, have really lasted in terms of the technical choices today. We've seen, you know, 
literally billions of dollars in bridge hacks over the past six months. We've seen the impact that a lack of network effects or liquidity for siloed you know, app chains or Ethereum competitors have, and the level of difficulty that these, these blockchains are actually having in developing uh, either true decentralization at a sort of governance or, or consensus mechanism uh, policy, or just the security that enables them to succeed. So I feel very validated in the choices that we made back then. There's still a lot to do, but I think you know the, the next few years are going to be the years of L2 and L3.